Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Teaneck International Film Festival. It is terrific to have you all here for this incredibly powerful documentary. Before I introduce our guests, let me simply say, 9 to 5, The Story of a Movement will premiere on PBS WNET-TV on the 1st of February. So we have two terrific guests with us tonight. Let me begin with Mary Jung, who's very familiar looking because she was pivotal in this movement and in the film. And we're thrilled that you are here. Um, you were part of the Cleveland Working Women from 1974 to 79. And that Mary traded Ohio for California, where she has worked in both the public and private sector sectors. Mary is currently the executive director of the San Francisco Association of Realtors. And she started the Welcome Home Project, which provides services to homeless families and individuals as they transition to permanent housing. Mary has been a tireless voice for the Asian American community and local politics. She spent four years as the chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party and 20 years on the Democratic City, Democratic City Central Committee. She serves on a whole host of committees, including Planned Parenthood of Northern California and is currently a member of the San Francisco Arts Commission. Mary, welcome and we're thrilled to have you here with us. This evening. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Now, the other familiar face here belongs to none other than Loretta Weinberg. So it turns out that my introduction to New Jersey State Senator Loretta Weinberg had to be updated because this political powerhouse announced today that she is retiring at the end of 2021. Loretta is New Jersey's longest serving, highest ranking female legislator, having been elected to the legislature in 1992, moving over to the Senate in 2005, was elected majority leader in 2012, a position she still holds. She has served on numerous committees, including the Joint Committee on Economic Justice and Equal Employment Opportunity. She formed the work group on harassment, sexual assault and misogyny in New Jersey politics. She's been a powerful voice for women's rights. The list of bills she sponsored is a mile long. I just simply want to say, Loretta, thank you for your commitment, your dedication, and your public service on behalf of the men, women, and children of the Garden State. You will be missed, but we've got you for another 12 Thank you, months. Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Ladies, let's begin. Mary, what Tell us how you got involved with this movement. So at the time I was a secretary in one of the downtown office buildings and there were two women in the office, five um, doctors um, who did um, industrial psychology. And, you know, it was a very typical you know, uh, secretarial job, you know, coming in in the morning. Um, I was trained early on how to make coffee for the five men. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. The more I think about it now, I mean, like, it's like, so this doctor likes two strips of Camorra. This doctor <laughs> likes um, a packet of Sanka, right? Um, so, but, you know, but that is what we grew into. This is what we knew the secretarial job was. But, you know, I would, I would go to work every day and I would do my job. And there was an older woman there who, um, who supervised me and she was fabulous. And she was wonderful. I mean, I thought she was perfect at her job. And one year, she didn't get the raise. She didn't get the, the bonus that she thought she would get because one of the doctors that she reported to couldn't get his expenses together. And so, so you know how it is with corporate, right? If you don't hand in your receipts, you don't get reimbursed, but he would, ex he would expect to be reimbursed. And because she couldn't keep track of his business travels and keep track of his receipts, she, um, she lost her bonus. And I just thought that was unfair. Now, mm. her being, um, you know, a 70s, you know, 60s, 50s woman, right? She thought it was perfectly fine. She actually thought that I should not have been upset for her. And so but there was another woman in the office, in another office next door. And she worked for a foundation and she had heard a Cleveland woman working. And she put a flyer up in the restroom and said, ladies, secretaries, 
um, do you ha um, how do you feel about your job? Come and meet Cleveland Women Working and let's talk about it. And I was intrigued. So I went to the very first organizing meeting and that's how I got started. I started as a regular member, part of the secretarial pool, part of the people that were being organized by Cleveland Women Working. And that was in 74, right? Yes. And you were- and the organization was just starting. And you were how old? You know, I, I think I was like 24. No, I was 23. 23. Yeah, or 22, yeah. And did that meeting really resonate with you? Did that really have an impact? You know, it did because what I, what I saw was that there were a lot of women who thought like I did, that all the things that I had been thinking about, like, why am I doing this? Why are, they not, um, why are there not more opportunities, you know, in the workforce? You know, not just, well, you know, my firm was quite small, but, you know, you could see what was going on in all the other industries in, in Cleveland. And so um, I was happy to be part of a group of, you know, you know, of women who saw that there was a better future. And I mm. knew there was a better future, that it couldn't always be like this. I didn't know what it was going to be like, but I knew that it didn't always have to be like this. So you were hooked? Yes. Loretta, where were you in the 70s? And, and tell us how this film resonated with you, considering what you have done in your political career. Well, in, at many different levels, so that would take me a while, but I will. In the 70s, mid-70s, I actually got a pretty good job beyond a secretarial pool. But in listening, uh, Mar Mary, your generation were two ahead of me, younger, and uh, we, my generation didn't think about questioning this. I started out as a receptionist and a secretary, where I think I started out as a receptionist and got promoted to being a secretary. But it really wouldn't have occurred to me or to anybody I knew to question uh, what we were being asked to do, what we were subjected to, and uh, what our pay scale was. Uh, fast forward, as I watched the evolution of these women uh, featured in the film, and I, there were so many parallels, I, if you'll pardon me, I got a great kick out of their going to bat for uh, tampon machines, mm. bathrooms, mm. because when we were first trying to get a piece of legislation passed to make insurance companies pay for at least 48 hours in the hospital for new moms and their babies back in the early 90s uh, in the era of drive-through deliveries. Uh, my co-sponsor from across the aisle, Assemblywoman Rose Heck and I, whenever we went to a committee meeting, we would say things in support of the bill why we needed more days breastfeeding <laughs> and bleeding and we kind of, <laughs> you know, drag out the words as best we could until most of the time the male dominated committees would be like, ah, okay, whatever you want, just stop giving us so much detail. So I really kind of got a good laugh out of what was going on on tampon machines a couple of generations uh, before that. So uh, there, there's a lot in here and it gives me positive feelings. Uh, we passed in New Jersey, the strongest pay equity bill in the United States of America. So that these kind, the kinds of things that these women faced, uh, hopefully women in New Jersey will not face. Um, but it was very much a period of kind of the, an era beyond where I started out. By the 70s, as I said, I had moved into a, uh, a better job, but I will tell you, it was one of my first political, I was working for a political body of elected officials. And um, we had this meeting, it was a T-shaped table with a long part of the T in front. And I sat at one end of the T and the lawyer for the group sat opposite me. 
And the first day we sat down, he said to me, would you get me a cup of coffee? And by that time I was sophisticated enough and confident enough that I said, no, you can get your own cup of coffee. And we became good friends, by the way, over the years. And when it was his, he had some big birthday, it was in his seventies. And I told that story publicly and then mm -hmm. served him a cup of coffee at his birthday that he'd been waiting 50 years for me to serve him, which I did. So yeah, it was still going on in the nineties. A woman sitting at the table, would you please get me a cup of coffee? Yeah, it's crazy. Mary, I want to know what this whole movement, how it really, really impacted you. Because you know what I was struck by also when we first met you in the film and you were, all, and you were saying that your mother said, you don't, you don't have to go to college, you know, you, or you don't, you shouldn't be going to college. Yeah, I wonder how did you process all of this? You were young and you were, and it, you know, the kind of like cannons to the right of me, cannons to the left of me. How did you, how did you deal with all of this? So, um, so for, so in, in many ways, I was fortunate as a, as a Chinese girl that I grew up in Ohio, which was full of um, people of other ethnicities. You know, in my neighborhood, it was very diverse. It was, um, you know, a third white, a third black, a third Puerto Rican. And, you know, in my high school of 800 kids, there were three Asian kids. You know, there was myself and there was a Japanese guy and there was another Chinese guy, right? And so I knew that there was something else out there. My mother being very traditional Chinese really did have a vision of what my life should, be look, should look like. But I knew that that was not what everyone else was looking at for their children, you know, whether, you know, whether they were going to go to college or not they did not see that there was this little box that I had to go into. Um, but, you know, one of the sad things is, is, is that, you know, even though you try to rebel against what your parents are teaching you, in some ways you end up doing it anyway. Mm. And so, you know, so what happened was, was that I did decide to go to college and it was like during the anti-war movement it, that um, George McGovern had just been nominated for um, president and one of his two things on his platform universal health care and ending the Vietnam War were, you know, were, were primary on the platform. And so I was on my way to school and I was stuck at a transfer stop and the bus was late. And I started talking to all the volunteers and the staff. And I just kind of thought, you know, this is just so much more interesting than what I'm about to do. And so I didn't get on that bus. I ended up instead being a full-time um, volunteer for McGovern, you know, for that year. And then after that, because I had kind of like blown in, in school for those several months, I went back and I got the traditional secretary's job that my mother thought I was supposed to get. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting also. You know what I was struck by in this film, because we're all fairly of a similar age, I didn't experience any of this when I got into the workforce. and. Uh, not that I'm apologizing for that, and but it was just really an interesting dynamic. Nobody ever asked me to make them coffee, thank goodness, because even today in 2021, I don't know how to make coffee. <laughs> and not only that, nobody you know tapped me on the behind or told me to come into the room and spin around or my favorite story, peel me carrots. Uh, yeah. I mean, from the you can't make this stuff up department. And it was almost like I was getting an education. And I guess part of it was back then when I was in college in 68, there was the Vietnam War, there was Kent State, whatever. And I wondered to myself if I was a little late to the game. Did, did do you understand that? Um, well, I think you were in school in a different era. Mm -hmm. I went to college in the 50s, mm -hmm. and um, it was a very different time. I mean, we were in college, and there was this expectation, well, you'll go to college, you'll meet a nice boy, become a school teacher, because then you'll have vacation time as the same time as your children. Mm -hmm. I remember my mother telling me that when I was about 18. I had no intentions of getting engaged or getting married and certainly not having children. So I wasn't worried about being home 
on their vacation period. But that mm-hmm. was one of her aspirations for me mm-hmm. to get a job that would accommodate my kids' schedule. Mm. But the 50s in college and the expectations of us as young women, I think was very different than what you experienced in the 60s. It was really a different world. And it was when, I mean, when I moved to Teaneck in 1964, as I tell people, it was the Vietnam, anti-Vietnam War, it was the civil rights movement, it was the women's rights movement. So it, it was all of this that was drawing us in mm. and um, making us realize that we had somehow been the victim of very limited aspirations and we had a way of channeling energy. Yeah, yeah. I, I see a question here that allow me to read um, the discussion about which a bigger union to latch onto, if any, when organizing a new union feels very relevant to organizers today. How do we actually do militant organizing in a climate that's union adverse, but where the older unions are often more conservative, business unions, et cetera? So what was your thought process is the question around joining SIEU and did you consider building nine to five as its own union? So um, so I was in Cleveland Women Working which was not organizing um, office workers. And so at, at the time when Karen and Ann and Ellen were looking at unionization, I believe that they did talk to a variety of unions and um, you know, local nine to five was supposed to be an offshoot. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And what was your feeling about unions, Loretta? Well, today we are seeing what the questioner called adverse uh, uh, union feeling. Uh, And yes, the bigger unions are more entrenched, more conservative, and uh, they have less members. I mean, union membership in our country and in our state sadly is going down. Uh, So I've always, any place I've worked has been a very robust union uh, uh, atmosphere, Uh, certainly in public service. We have all kinds of unions in the state from the Education Association to NJEA, to uh, office workers, to uh, law enforcement and everything in between. Uh, But there is a downward movement unhappily and uh, SEIU is still out there. I had a meeting with them yesterday, in fact, Mm -hmm. uh, because they organize the uh, workers at the airports. Mm -hmm. Uh, the baggage handlers and uh, the people who push a wheelchair, if you need a wheelchair, that that workforce. And it's complex because you have the New York airports and the New Jersey airports and two different governing boards. So um, SEIU is definitely very much in the forefront. But as I said, there's a conservative streak um, among some of the larger unions. Mm. Somebody made a comment here as a former union steward, it depends on your boss, you will be targeted. My female boss got rid of 13 folks, mostly the stewards. You have to work a union force that wants to be unionized. And then the comment was most just want their checks. There's some feeling about that on Mm. the part of your members in in some of the big Mm. unions. And then when they hear, uh, you know, union leaders making in the six figures plus, uh, that that creates some dissension too. Right, for sure. Mary, back to sort of your youth um, for a minute and and your organizing in Cleveland. What was that process like for you? Was it overwhelming? Was it debilitating? Were you, were your knees knocking at all? And how did you feel during that time? Did you feel just so empowered? I loved it. I mean, one of my favorite books in high school was 
um, labor's untold story. I mean, I, you know, looking back at it now, I think that I was, I, that I'm really fortunate that I had the opportunity to do exactly what I wanted to do, um, you know, in my early 20s, which was to be an organizer. You know, at the time we were called community organizers. And then for a while there, um, you know, um, people had a different, you know, um, a different name for it, right? But um, I, felt, I felt empowered, I felt um, energized. I loved working with the women. I loved um, being able to stretch myself and try different things. And um, even though you know, I'm somewhat of an introvert, I really cared about the women members that we had. And everyone was just very, very thoughtful and really tried to, um, to, ad to advance the movement. And even though like our, a lot of our members were very mainstream, they didn't even realize they were part of a movement, mm -hmm. they all tried to be as nurturing as possible. And you know, I, I think one of the things about Cleveland Women Working is, is, is that I really learned the value of mentorship and how important it is for us to mentor the next generation of young people, whether it's young women or young men, um, and, make, and making sure that they're able to also bring society up. And considering on some level that you were not mentored <laughs> yourself, that you, you know, this was kind of not trial by fire, but you were teaching yourself what to do. Yes, but um, the women who run, ran the organization, I mean, Karen Nussbaum is a fabulous mentor. Helen Williams, who was the executive director of Cleveland Women, Cleveland Women Working, was, a, was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you know, like many young women at that time, um, you know, the things that we went through were troublesome, right? And, you know, nowadays we have terms for it, you know, and the Me Too movement, um, you know, Time's Up. It's, it's you know, it's given us a, a way to talk about it. But back then we didn't have them. And so, you know, I had these strong women who were, so I was the youngest of, of everybody. And so I had people who even like, even with like just four to six years more experience than me, they had already lived a lot more of their lives than I had because they had gone to college. They had lived away from, moved away from home and had a whole world of experience that I didn't have. And so they were able to um, help me. Um, and so, um, you know, I was so happy when Julia Reichert called me years ago and, and brought me back into um, contact with these women I worked with because I was able to thank them. I was able to see Helen face to face and just say, thank you for saving my life. Oh, that must have been very emotional to reconnect with these women that had such a, played such a seminal role in your life. And you know, it's, it's funny, it's like you, you, do, you go through your life, you know, you do the things that you do every day, you try to do the right thing and you really don't know the effect that you've had on individuals. And you know, Helen had no idea right? And you know, Loretta, I'm sure that, um, you know, as you go into retirement, every day you walk down the street, someone is going to stop you in the street and thank you for something that you've done that has made a difference in their life. And, you know, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And so, you know, I'm grateful for the women who helped me move forward. And, you know, I, I'm at that stage where people call me and thank me. And it's like, for what, right? I mean, it's like, it was, it, it's just what you do, right? Well, not for, every day. not for nothing, Loretta, as, as well as Mary, one of my biggest takeaways is also that we, we stand on your shoulders yes. <laughs> and, and, and that is just so true. And I, I can, I almost get emotional about it. We're, we're so grateful to the Loretta's and the Mary's and the Karen Nussbaum's and, and it goes on and on and on. Just there's deification here. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. You know, uh, Mary touched on it, or you touched on it too, Sandy, when you used the word nurturing, which you d wouldn't hear used too often in union organizing, but it was used in the film. Mm -hmm. And that the women found new nurturing, I think they actually used the word, ways of uh, attracting membership to the group because it was aimed at women. They understood women. They, I, I love the story about bus stops and, and the woman who said, she said, well, bus stops were always a favorite campaign place for me. <laughs> I can tell you by heart, every single bus stop between Fort Lee and Teaneck uh, <laughs> at the height of campaign season. So uh, 
there was a different language. And again, Mary touched on that. I believe when I got my first job in the late 50s, that I don't think there was a term called sexual harassment. I mean, we would, did, did not have the language to even describe what was happening, let alone think that we didn't have to subject ourselves. Uh, I've often described in my younger days, it was making sure you always knew where the doorway was. Mm. And, and that was our line of defense. Right. And, uh, you know, now, <laughs> generations later, we're passing pretty good laws against that kind of thing and protecting women who come forth and um, have legitimate grievances. So it, it, it's so interesting to be able to see, as I said, just we didn't even have the words for it mm -hmm. uh, in my generation. And then that it, because it was women doing the organizing, it was a different kind of organizing. And as I watched the film, th those are some of the similarities that, that struck me. So Mary, you're still much younger than I am, remember. So you have a lot of years ahead of you yet <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to continue organizing and nurturing, two great words. Did, did the women for the most part come together as a whole in terms of unification? You know, all that kind of, oh, well, you know, you get a bunch of women together and they're all be, you know, at each other. And that, there was this incredible, what you were all in this together and you were, you all supported each other. Was there any friction whatsoever? Do you recall Mary? So I don't, I don't remember any friction. I mean, you know, I mean, in general, you know, when you're talking about um, women office workers at the time, we're, we were, um, you know, we were used to being told what to do. Mm. And so for us to come, and usually when people came to our meetings, they came in pairs, like they would come, they, they would come with a coworker or, you know, they would co you know, come as their friend, like across the hall, right? And so they always had somebody. But, um, you know, I remember at Cleveland Women Working and, you know, they touched on this in the film where we really made it a point to talk to the new people and figure out a way to engage them. So if we saw a new person in a meeting, we would make sure that we would go and sit next to them and we would engage with them. We'd set up a lunch with them um, and, and you know, just try to um, make, them to be a, make them be a part of it. And you know, a lot of the things that we, we did instinctively, right? I, mean, I, don't think, I don't think anyone told us, we just knew that this is what you do when you're trying to, to build an organization. And so, and you know what, you know, when people talk about, oh, well, I would always make sure that someone brought something to a meeting to make sure they got to the meeting. Well, shoot, I remember doing that for like my son's fourth birthday party, right? <laughs> Always make sure that someone was bringing the fruit tart, somebody was bringing, the, you know, um, the cake, right? <laughs> you know, what else struck me was uh, in the film when Jane Fonda came to Cleveland with the script about it for, for nine to five and the fact that you were appalled when she said to anybody, <laughs> I was just so great, entertain the idea, right, of um, killing their boss. And yeah. everybody was appalled everybody until everybody ran, said, yeah, everybody. Everybody. Ran, no, no. All so the funny. women were not appalled. All the organizers were appalled because we had this vision of very mainstream, um, you know, women who just, you know, they might be angry at their bosses. And it was really hard to get them to take that first step. You know, it was hard to get them to go out and hand out a flyer with you, right? <laughs> um, let alone um, train them to go out and speak in front of 25 people and then 100 people and then 500 people. And so, the, so, <laughs> so then to hear them talk about these things, and you know, we just always thought that that was, that they were, we always thought they were milder. Mm -hmm. Back to the union over here, another comment. The organizing looks so successful and yet after all these years, how far have we come? It's disheartening by the way 
into the 90s, I was still asked usually by visiting male guests to the Board of Education offices to make coffees, to make coffee. So maybe Keurig has finally eliminated that offense. <laughs> you can also just use a K-cup and leave me the hell alone. Um, so, you know, you wonder again, if it's that line, everything old is new again, you know, it, um, have we come as far as we could? Not so, huh? Now, you know what? We never come as far as we should. And if I have learned anything in public life, there is nothing that I consider done. Right. Everything takes nurturing and constant calls for accountability. And if you don't have those built into the system or have the watchers watching, you tend to slip back mm. to the old method of operating. And if I had to import one, impart one lesson to people, particularly in public life or in organizing life, that you can never mark this as, yes, I've completed it. It's always a work in progress. It's always a work in progress and always the necessity to make sure that there's accountability. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that somebody's asking the right questions. Yeah, that's true. Another, so I, go ahead, Mary. No, go ahead. When I talk to um, young people about organizing and democratic politics and how to get active, how to be active, you know, I always point to 1972 when um, universal health care, I think it was the first time, was on the Democratic Party platform. And it took 40 years to get Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, which is another name for universal health care. Mm -hmm. And then even after 40 years of it passing, you know, um, the Republicans are still trying to repeal it um, every, se you know, every session. And so Loretta is absolutely right. The fight is not over. You know, right now I'm on the board of Planned Parenthood and I remember how important mm -hmm. choice was such a big issue in the 70s. And um, I thought, and back then I thought, well, this is just, this is just really, really great, right? right? Women finally have the right to choose and right. you don't have to worry about those rights being taken away wrong. We have to be so vigilant about what's going on out there. The fight is never over, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. What, in your legacy, Loretta, what do you want us to remember in terms of, uh, and what is it that you want us to continue to do? Well, you know, I have some favorite subjects or favorite pieces of legislation, but what you asked me is really, a, I guess, kind of bigger, more global uh, question. It's that anything, that a lot of things take focus and discipline and Mary just talked about it, even something like women's reproductive health. We came so far and now we're seeing mm -hmm. trying to undermine uh, that. So anything really worthwhile might take a while. You might take Discipline, patience, but you have to be willing to stick with whatever it is you think is important until you get it through. And then you have to make sure you're watching mm. to make sure that it stays in the robust manner that you tried to work for. N no nothing's guaranteed here. Public service is the most exciting, wonderful way to lead one's life. And certainly were the kinds of work, Mary, while you were a, um, uh, an organizer for George McGovern, I was a delegate to that convention. I was a McGovern delegate to that convention in 1972, where we were, didn't realize that we weren't supposed to nominate the president at three in the morning that we were supposed to do it on uh, live uh, evening TV. <laughs> right, prime time. Yeah, that's right, on prime time. So uh, we were pretty, talk about being green and um, uh, not prepared, but we got that far. And uh, that opening of, of the party generated much that we saw in the, in the following generations even though George McGovern lost very pretty badly mm. in that. Mm. I think Teaneck was probably the only town he carried. 
<laughs> to those of us from Teaneck, we understand. Right. Uh, so I, it, it's just that all of this is, it's not overnight and you need to be willing to say this is important enough and it gives back, I think, the most exciting ways to spend a day. And, and Mary, as you said, when somebody stops you, I, not too long ago in the summer actually, and I had ordered some plants for my little terrace and the landscaper who came to visit said, you don't remember me, but this is my 17 year old son when he was two years old and diagnosed with, uh, uh, with the Asperger's, you were the one who got intervention services for us. And here he is graduating Tenafly wow. High School. Wow. So, uh, and, <laughs> and 15 years later, they were planting plants on my little porch. Mm. So if that doesn't make this kind of a life worthwhile, then, then I don't have too much to impart to you, but it does make it worthwhile. You do change the world one person at a time and you just keep working for your goals. You just have to be clear what they are. Right. And when I watched this group of women, and it, it wasn't talked about that much, but it's so different than a way a group of men in the same, trying to organize, <clears throat> let's say, for a union. It's so different in their approaches. Uh, and Mary described some of it. You know, we invited somebody to lunch we uh, wanted to make sure they were comfortable, that they felt supported. And uh, it's just, we, we have a different view of the way we work. And uh, just one other quick thing, which is kind of an inside joke that we, the women in the legislature use, <clears throat> that uh, we always feel like we need to be prepared. We need the briefing book or we need notes for a speech or something under our arms and we want to study the issue and know the pros and cons and a man wakes up in the morning looks in the mirror and says i can be governor <laughs> and uh mary just talked about how they just learned by doing that she learned from how she organized her four-year-old's birthday party right right so we as women need to develop a little more self-confidence and i think films like this are the things that really help for a woman to say, uh, you know what, I could do that. I don't yeah. need a briefing book. Right. I organized my four-year-old's birthday party. Right, it's very empowering. No, it's true, yeah. it's really true. Um, a question here, are young people getting any of this in school? It seems as though activists are few and far between. I would expect all women to be on the same page. If they were, we wouldn't be going through what we are now as a country. It's incomprehensible to me and I don't understand it. I feel as though something is missing in education today. You, either of you have an opinion? Yes, yeah, civics is missing in education today and we need to have more of it. Uh, I have teenage grandchildren and what they get in terms of a real understanding of government besides knowing me it is mostly from extracurricular things that they sign up for. The Y has a wonderful program uh, for young people there, but schools really need to teach more civics, more what our government is, is actually how it's constructed, what an election means, mm. how you count votes. The, those are things that really need to be brought back into the curriculum, I think. You know, Mary, I've said this a lot and it certainly applies to nine to five. The power of documentaries just can't be understated mm -hmm. to show this film everywhere. And, and what all of you women did, how you came together, there was no, <laughs> Hey, maybe we, you just did it. And because you knew that you had to do it. And that is so empowering. Uh, the, the, this film is potent. It's more than a public service, even especially in 2021. 
You know, I think the one thing that, that I think what the past four years have taught us, maybe the past five years, is just that every little thing that we do matters, okay? And, um, you, know, you know, I remember when, uh, what I felt was the, the country first going off the rails and people would say, oh no, that's, it'll be fine. Don't worry about that. And every week there would just be some new thing that happened that would just make my, uh, my, my hair stand on end, right? And had, had we earlier on maybe taken, you know, I, and I don't know what those steps could have been, right? But, you know, been more forceful, maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the situation, you know, where we were last, last week at the Capitol. I mean, that mm. never should have happened. Mm. You know, but you know, when we talk about patriotism and people talk about how um, that, um, oh, don't worry, you know, um, this guy really can't be all the things that you think that he is, right? And so, yeah, yeah. but you know, he looks like a duck, he acts like a duck, talks like a duck, I think he's a duck, right? <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I think if anything, we really have to just, pay, you know, it's like Loretta said, we have to be mindful. Everything is important. Everything that, you know, every email, that, you know, every conversation, it's all important. It all means something. It's that slow drip, you know, that leads into history. Yeah. How did you react to the film? Um, so, so I, you know, I don't like to see myself on TV, right? And so, so there was that. And yeah, so we I, all have that. <laughs> I did it with um, a group, a, a group of friends, um, you know, some, you know, um, one of them is, one of my mentors in San Francisco and, you know, just some, you know, other women my age who, um, you know, went through the same thing, but actually they didn't know about my history. And so it was probably more interesting for them. And so, you know, for me, it was just more like, oh yeah, I remember when I said that. Oh yeah, I remember, you know, when Julia came and we did this, right? Oh, I remember going to Cleveland, right? Um, but um, the reaction of people who've seen it has been really interesting because, um, they don't realize what, I mean, even women of my generation don't remember, you know, it's a reminder of how far we've come and, you know, in some ways, how far we still need to go. For sure. Yes, for sure. Um, we're going to wrap up, but I wanted to ask you one more question, um, Mary. What did you think of the Fonda, Tomlin, and Parton 9 to 5 feature? I thought it was extremely funny. I thought it was great. Um, you know, at that time, I did the very traditional thing where I had just gotten engaged and I had actually moved away from Cleveland with my fiance. And, um, and so I saw the movie, not with the woman from nine to five, I saw it with my, you know, my boyfriend at the time, right? But I thought it was great. I thought it was a hoot. And, um, and, and Karen and Ellen are absolutely right. The reaction to the movie was really fun in the theater. I mean, people were just laughing the entire time. And also screaming, turn off the press stop. <laughs> just papers <laughs> flying out of the Xerox machine. Yes. Well, Loretta and Mary, and to all the women, this has just been a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's just been a pleasure to meet you, Mary and Loretta not enough accolades can be said. I, you are an extraordinary person and your announcement today about retirement is still blowing up on Facebook with all kinds of lovely postings and comments. And um, I could get a little emotional, but I'm so grateful for the Mary Jungs of the world. And God knows we're certainly grateful for the Loretta Weinbergs of the world. And as I said, you know, not too long ago, um, we stand on your shoulders. And um, I just, uh, I'm going to read another comment here. Um, uh, please extend our collective thanks to Loretta for her tireless advocacy for so many worthy causes for the residents of New Jersey and Mary in Ohio. And speaking of asking the right questions, we are all indebted to Loretta Weinberg for <laughs> about the holdup of the George Washington Bridge, holding hearings on female experiences in the government workplace. She's ex exhibited the stick to that we all need to emulate. Thank you for who you are and what we have learned from you. And um, 
nine to five is more than a movement. It is just a powerful force for women. And um, I feel very blessed to have known you, Loretta, and to have met you, Mary. And I feel like I really know you considering I've watched the film three times. <laughs> But um, we all have to soldier on. These are, these are trying times. But to the Teaneck Film Festival and to Indie Pop-Up Lens, we're very, very grateful. And um, thank you so much to um, everybody involved. You're two hell of a broads. <laughs> Thanks, I like that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> Good night and thank you all so much for watching the film and joining us for this talk back. Thank you. And thank you, Loretta, for everything. Thank you, Mary. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>